All right, wonderful students. Here we go with wound care definitions, dressings, and treatments. Healing by first or primary intention refers to the healing of a wound in which the edges are closely reapproximated or brought together with sutures, stables, glue, etc. This is the type of wound healing where union or restoration occurs directly and has the minimalist of granulation tissue and the minimalist of scar formation. So this is when you see the skin come together nicely and perfectly and it heals with minimal to no scarring. Secondary intention healing is when a wound is left open. No sutures or other materials are used to close the wound. Typically it's because it's so large or there isn't enough tissue to do so. Dressings are applied instead in order to protect the wound from contamination. Healing by second intention or second intention healing takes place when the wound edges cannot be approximated and therefore the wound needs to heal from the bottom up, right? You always want the wounds to heal from the inside out. Um, and again, with secondary intention, there is typically a very large tissue deficit, right? So they can't close those wounds. Two common complications of surgical wounds are infections, as well as wound dehiscence, right? Where, where the uh, staples or sutures or whatever pops open, right? And then you have a dehiscence, you have, you know, tissue exposed. As such, the following signs should be looked out for in the post-operative wound review. Uh, we should be looking for fever, hematomas, seromas, separation of wound edges, purulent drainage, or any drainage from the room, wound, right? It is important to bear in mind that inflammation of a surgical wound is part of the physiological process of healing and is expected, right? Anytime we cut on tissue, we know that inflammation is going to occur in the body and the white blood cells are going to go to that site. That's normal. So we do expect that to occur, right? So in the absence of other clinical findings, there's not a problem, right? We don't, we don't equate that to a wound complication, just the inflammation from the injury of cutting into the patient, right? Also remember what Marcel states in class, po uh, post-op day one's focus is bleeding or hemorrhaging. Day two's focus is typically DVTs and PEs, right? Because they're not as ambulatory, right? So blood's pooling and therefore you could get a DVT that could break off and become a pulmonary embolism, right? Um, day three, typically infection, right? It takes 48 to 72 hours to see infection show up as well as pneumonia, right? Other complications include fistulas and evisceration. So evisceration is when all of the abdominal cavities spill out onto the patient, you know, outside the opening of the sutures. Remember, as mentioned in your readings, evisceration is the biggest risk with abdominal surgeries as we use our abdominal muscles to cough, breathe, move around. So it's very imperative that we teach patients how to Splint their abdomen when coughing, deep breathing, moving around post-op. Wound dehiscence is when a surgical incision that has been stitched or stapled closed comes open again. Wound dehiscence um, is the separation of the wound edges at the suture line. A healthy healing wound should be well approximated, meaning that the edges should meet neatly and are held together by suture, staples, uh, glue, some method of closure. A wound is at the greatest risk of dehiscence in the first six to eight days after surgery when the wound is still fresh and very fragile. In all cases, dehiscence should be reported to the surgeon, right? This most often occurs with surgery done on the abdomen and about half of them are due to infection. A wound can become separated when stress or tension overcomes the strength of the stitches or staples or the glue that's used to close the incision. This may happen from coughing, lifting, it could be strenuous exercise, movements, simple movements or actions, right? It can also occur if the wound has not been closed correctly. And it also can happen um, to wounds that don't heal correctly as well. This can occur in people who smoke or who have certain chronic conditions. 
Treatment for wound dehiscence depends on how large the opening is, as you can see in the two different pictures. Um, we would treat those two totally different, right? So how we treat it really depends on how large that opening is, whether there is infection involved, how soon the incision opened up after surgery, and whether you have other conditions that make it harder for the wound to heal. Those are all variables we look at. This might include like diabetes, smoking, poor nutrition, all of those things, right? Treatment includes pain medication, antibiotics to treat infection, surgery to remove dead or infected tissue, right? We call that uh, debridement. Wet to dry dressing. For this treatment, the wound is filled with a wet or moist gauze. Then it's covered with a dry dressing. This helps the wound to heal from the bottom up, right? So we're going to pack any of the areas that we have to pack, right? Because if you don't pack, you know, if there's a hole there, you got to fill it up so the body, again, heals from the inside out. We might even have like a vacuum assisted closure over the wound, like a wound vac, right? Um, wound vacs use air pressure to help the wound heal more quickly by pulling fluid and air out of the wound and by helping new tissue grow, right? And we may need to go back into surgery. A lot of these patients do. So in some cases, the surgeon, you know, will go back into surgery and reclose the wound. Now, wound evisceration is different, as you can see on the pictures, right? Wound evisceration is the protrusion of the internal organs, almost always in the abdomen, uh, through an incision. So evisceration is a rare thing. It doesn't happen a lot, but when it does, it is considered a severe surgical complication, and it is a medical emergency and should be treated as such, and the patient is immediately going back into surgery. So, again, evisceration is the uncontrolled exteriorization of the intra-abdominal contents through the dehist surgical wound outside of the abdominal cavity. Nursing interventions would include immediately placing the patient in a low Fowler's position with their knees bent to prevent more of the abdominal uh, tension on the abdominal suture line, thus hoping, you know, hopefully not pushing more of their internal organs out. Uh, right after doing those two things, um, you would call a rapid response and notify the physician that he's going back into surgery, right? To prevent wound infection, the third thing you're going to do is you're going to treat this patient with strict a sepsis, okay? So you're gonna take some sterile four by fours, you're gonna soak them in sterile normal saline, and you're gonna place them soaked sterile four by fours over the protruding organs, okay? Because remember, these organs are on the inside of the body and they need to stay moist. So we're gonna keep them moist until the patient's wheeled back into surgery. We're also gonna administer antemetics. Um, and because think about it if they were to start vomiting then that would put way more strain on the abdominal incision right um and then of course we're going to wheel them into surgery so epithelial resurfacing completes at about two to three days uh no tensile strength uh but it does become impenetrable to bacteria. So in two to three days, you know, the healing of the wounds or the incision line um, is pretty good as far as keeping bacteria out, but it isn't as, you know, as far as tensile strength, meaning it's not going to break open, you know, uh, if we apply tension to it. So you just got to be careful with it, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Um, Collagen begins immediately after the inflammation phase, and by days five through nine, you should be able to palpate a healing collagen ridge line beneath the skin, about a one centimeter on each side of the wound. Um, most dehiscences, you know, if, if a patient's wound is going to dehiss, typically occurs five to eight, five to eight days post-op, and about half of those are associated with an infection um, in the ridge. Um, so, when a nurse is there, we're going to assess for that ridge, right? And a lack of ridge would mean that we need to reduce incisional strain so we're going to really treat that incision carefully right um, so
So if I was to do an evaluation and there was no ridge line, I would not take out uh, the sutures, right? I would keep them in longer. But when we go to do, when it's time for the suture removal and there is, you know, that healing ridge, that tells us it's safe to remove those sutures. Seri strips are typically used for cuts or wounds that aren't too severe or for minor surgery. Um, they help seal wounds by pulling the two sides of the skin together without making any contact with the actual wound itself. Uh, Monterey, uh, Montgomery straps are hypoallergenic, like adhesive straps that we use to facilitate frequent dressing changes where we don't actually have to remove um, and reapply tape tons of times a day so it's, they're really cool um, breathable strong and comfortable they help prevent uh, skin trauma like you know because taking tape off a ton of times a day can really break down the skin right so they're great for that let's see what else surgical staples are specialized staples used in surgery in place of sutures to, to close skin wounds or connect or remove parts of the bowels or lungs the use of staples over sutures reduces the local inflammatory response within the body. Uh, it also reduces the width of the wound itself and the time it takes to close, you know, the patient. And a suture is a stitch or a row of stitches holding together the edges of a wound uh, from the surgical incision. Tertiary healing or third intention is delayed primary wound healing after four to six days. This occurs when the process of secondary intention is intentionally interrupted and the wound is mechanically closed. This usually occurs after granulation tissue has formed. And this is typically due to delayed wound healing for various reasons, like it could be a chronic wound or it could be a wound that needs to be reopened. Um, for an extended time frame, uh, maybe it's a wound that needs grafting or flaps put on. It could be for a number of reasons, right? And it's also important to note that that care is typically needed for both the donor and the recipient of the skin sites for these patients, right? So if it's an autologous donation, again, um, both sites will need to be taken care of. Um, it's imperative that the wound care protocol are followed exactly as they are written by the provider um, after these procedures, okay? Very, very important that when an autologous skin donation is made, when you treat that patient's both of their wound sites, you are following, you know, verbatim what the doctor's orders are, okay? Corticosteroids, like prednisone, have been shown to be very effective with aiding in the repair of orthopedic surgeries by directly aiding in skeletal repair, muscle repair, which allows for sh the strengthening of the bones, right? And corticosteroids also reduce the activity of the immune system by affecting the way white blood cells work. So we use corticosteroids to help reduce the inflammation response in the body to allow for repair and healing. Um, however, one side effect of corticosteroids um, is prednisone skin, um, and that is skin actually atrophies um, when we have uh, topical steroid overuse. Okay, skin can atrophy. I shouldn't say it always does because it doesn't. But if, if uh, in, in some cases, if we use topical steroids and we overuse them, um, we can get prednisone skin, okay? And this is literally, it's the thinning of the upper layer of the skin, the epidermis, right? It's major thinning of that. And there are structural changes as well in the middle layer or the dermis, right? Um, and I think it's important to note that even at low doses, prednisone can cause skin issues like, you know, skin thinning or acne or maybe even excessive hair growth. What is that? Herturism, um, hair thinning, uh, face redness, stria, those, um, you know, striae, which is like the stretch-like marks, you know, the stretch marks-ish like, um, and impaired wound healing too, right? When we take prednisone, it can impair wound healing or delay it at least. Um, malnutrition refers to all forms of deficiencies, excess or imbalance. Let me repeat that. Malnutrition refers to all forms of deficiencies, excess or imbalance. Um, in a person's intake of energy and or the, their nutrients. The elderly have the highest risk of chronic wound. <laughs> the elderly have the highest 
risk of chronic wo wounds. Good Lord, I'm having trouble saying chronic wounds. Okay, so the elderly have the highest risk of chronic wounds due to coexisting comorbidities, right? Um, due to their decrease in hydration and consumption. Remember, this is due to the decreased hunger mechanisms, decreased fluid intake. They already start with less water in their plasma to begin with, right? So a decreased water volume in their plasma. They also have a change in their taste buds, causing foods not to be as enticing or desirable. All of these things affect that, right? Protein and calories affect wound healing as the body needs protein to help build and repair muscle build and repair skin, and build and repair body tissues. Protein also helps fight infection. It helps balance body fluids, and it also helps carry oxygen through the body. When a patient has a wound that's healing, think of food as medicine for the wound. Eating a balanced diet with enough calories and plenty of protein will directly help to heal the wound, okay? Protein significantly affects the entire process of wound healing through the rules of RNA and DNA synthesis, through collagen and elastic tissue formation, through the immune system function, through epidermal growth, and through keratinization, okay? It does all of those things. That's why it's critically important. Therefore, it's really, really vital for patients who have wounds to consume lots of protein foods. And if they only, we have them start with the protein, by the way, when they're eating, especially the elderly, right? Because if they get full, we want them at least to get the protein for the wound. All right, to ensure proper healing through the expected stages, the wound base should be well vascularized, free of devitalized tissue, clear of infection, and it should be kept moist. Wound dressings might help facilitate this process if they eliminate dead space, if they control exudate, if they prevent bacteria overgrowth. Um, they do it by ensuring proper flu uh, fluid balance. Um, and they, you know, wound dressings are very cost effective. Um, and they, wounds with progressive healing um, helps with granulation tissues and epithelialization and all of those things, right? Um, and I think it's important to note that all wounds are colonized with microbes. However, not all wounds are infected, right? Some wounds are not infected, so. And if they are infected, we treat those wounds with additional treatments like antibiotic therapy and other things, right? Okay. Maceration occurs when skin has been exposed to moisture for too long. A very telltale sign of maceration is when the skin looks really soggy or it feels soft. Um, it appears whiter than usual, right? Um, and there may be a white ring around the, wo the wound itself, right? When, when there's too much moisture in the wound and it's seeping out on the edges on the outside. Um, um, or the wound has too much drainage, right? So wound beds should be moist, not soaking wet. So again, I'm gonna say that again. Wound beds should be moist, but not soaking wet. And the outside skin or edges around the wound should be dry, okay? Wounds should heal from the inside out. So it's imperative that as a nurse, we pack a wound to ensure this happens. And when I say pack, I'm talking lightly pack. Don't pack it tight tightly, you're going to pack it lightly, L-I-G-H-T-L-Y, lightly. Uh, never overfill a wound as it will cause complications. You know, you need to fill all aspects of the wound, um, but again, don't pack it. Use a cotton swab to gently guide the dressing material into small or tunneled areas because we need to make sure that it heals from the inside out. Draining, draining wounds are most often filled with strip gauze or slightly absorbent materials. Do not apply frayed products or which cannot be easily retrieved when we do our dressing changes, okay? Document how much product is inserted how, and how much dead space there is and compare it to what you actually remove from the previous dressing that's in there, okay? We're keeping real close track of all of the material that's inside that wound because if, God forbid, we pack a wound and then leave a little piece of it in there, that will eventually cause a serious infection, okay? 
So any foreign material left behind in that dead space may prolong and prevent healing and actually lead to a severe infection, okay? So, um, and then after you do that, you know, pack the wound lightly with the uh, coated gauze, uh, you're going to then put a secondary dressing over it. Wound dressing should provide the most optimum conditions for wound healing while protecting the wound from infection, from microbes, and also protecting it from trauma. It's important that the dressings be removed um, atraumatically, be very gentle to the skin, right? Especially with the elderly, it's very, very thin. And we want to avoid excess use uh, of tape, and we want to use nonstick dressings when possible and also treat the skin with uh, skin prep, right? That helps the tape pull off easier. Wound documentation is critical for the delivery of effective wound care and the facil facilitation of uh, continuity of care, right? So unfortunately, almost half of all medical record notes on assessment and interventions in some settings with wounds is inaccurate, okay? So we gotta be careful with our wound documentation. So what should be considered for wound documentation exactly? Well, proper wound care uh, documentation can be broken up into several categories. Overall, documentation should record the following elements. You should have the wound etiology or cause, like for example, was it a pressure injury? Was it a venous injury? Was it an arterial injury? Was it a surgical incision injury? What it, you know? So what is its etiology? Second, does the wound have an odor? Is it strong? Is it foul? Is it pungent? Like what? It, what is the odor? None. Does it not have an odor? Number three, wound location. So you're going to describe with proper anatomical terms. Number four, wound size. You're going to measure the wound in centimeters and you're going to include length, width, and depth. Step six, you're gonna have wound bed characteristics. This would include tissue amounts and types. In other words, granulation, sloth, eschar, epithelialization, right? Starting of new tissue. Seven, you're gonna indicate if infection is involved, right? And if infection's involved, you're gonna include, is there a fever? Is there erythema? Is there increased drainage? Is there any odor, warmth, edema, elevated white blood cell count, induration, pain, all of those things, right? Um, and then you also want to document the perimeter of the wound. Exactly, you know, describe what the wound edges look like, right? Um, are they defined? Are they undefined wound edges? Um, are they attached? Are they unattached wound edges? Is there a epoboli, um, which is the rolled wound edges? Is it macerated or white skin that is wrinkled because of the it's too moist right on the outside. It's supposed to be dry on the outside, right? Um, and then you also need to document any kind of exudate, right? So if the wound has exudate, it can manifest in many forms. Considering the type and amount of exudate is often a determining factor for dressing types and other intervention methods. So you're definitely going to want to document, is it serous type of exudate? Remember, serous is thin, watery, clear. Or is it sanguinous? thin, bright red with fresh bleeding? Or is it serosanguinous, which is pale red to pink, more pink probably, thin, watery, right? Or is it purul purulent? I always slaughter that word, P-U-R-U-L-E-N-T. That is thicker, thin, opaque, tan to a yellow color. Um, foul purulent is thick and it's a really opaque tan to green color and it does have an odor, right? It's foul. Um, wound exudate amount. So you will either say none, the wound tissue is dry, or you'll say scant, the wound tissue is moist, but no measurable drainage. Well, you'll say minimal, the wound tissue is moist with less than 25% of the dressing saturated over the last 24 hours, or it's moderate. This is where the wound dressing is wet and it has 25 to 75% of the dressing is saturated over the last 24 hours. Large amount would be 75% of the dressing greater than 75% of the dressing saturated over 24 hours. That would be large. Um, for pressure injuries, the stage and type of injury should be documented as follow. 
Stage one is intact skin with a localized area of non-blanchable erythema. Stage two is partial thickness loss of skin with exposed dermis and a viable wound bed. Stage three would be full thickness loss of skin with visible adipose tissue. Stage four would be full thickness loss of skin and tissue with exposed or palpable fascia, muscle, tendon, ligament, cartilage, bone, okay? Um, unstageable would mean that the wound is obscured by sloth or maybe eschar. Um, so the extent of full thickness skin and tissue loss cannot be confirmed. If you cannot see it, it is unstageable, okay? Deep tissue injuries are intact or non-intact skin with a localized area of non-blanchable discoloration or epidermal separation revealing a dark wound bed, okay? Wound beds, it's important to document. Um, sorry, I had to click the screen up. Wound bed. It's important to document the tissue type. Is it sloth, eschar, epithelial? Is it granulation tissue? You want to also document the coloring, um, the level of adherence using percentages. So for example, you want to say something along the lines of 40% of the wound is covered in non-adherent tan sloth, while 60% is covered with red granulation tissue. You want to be that precise, okay? Um, Wound-based description should be literally about the appearance of the wound bed, right? So I would say something along the lines, and you want to use percentages again. I would say something along the lines like the wound base is 75% granulation tissue with 25% soft tissue, granulation tissue, uh, pink or beefy red tissue with a shiny, moist, granular appearance. So that's what granulation tissue is. Um, so pause the video and make flashcards on this information because it's critically important that you commit all of these terms to your long-term memory, okay? Wounds do best in moist environments. Um, so not too wet, but not too dry, okay? So it needs to be a moist environment on the wound bed. The skin around the wound, again, should be dry, but the wound bed should be moist. So you want to loosely pack the... Uh, wound when needed that when needed means if there's any tissue missing that needs to be filled in right because if there's missing tissue we've already discussed this in detail but if there's missing tissue and you don't pack it then the body is gonna uh, start to heal from the it'll go the opposite way inside the body it'll start tunneling and form a fistula so you got to pack those wounds and you do do that loosely right we're not going to pack it too tightly um, because tight, packing too tightly results in uh, injury to the wound bed itself, right? And just makes it worse. We're also gonna protect peri wound skin. Never put skin barrier there. We're gonna clean, ir cleanse, irrigate before we ever do our assessments, right? Because we gotta be able to see the wound bed really well. So again, we're gonna take off the old dressing, cleanse it really well, really well before we even do our assessment. Um, and I should have started with this, but we're going to pre-medicate our patients 30 minutes before the dressing change with morphine or whatever they have on order for their pain med, right? Because dressing changes can be painful, right? If culture is needed, if a culture is needed, we're going to cleanse the wound thoroughly again before we ever take our sample. Because again, you want to get, you want to swab the area of the wound where the granulation or viable tissue is okay never ever culture a wound before it's cleaned up well with all that sloth and stuff and of course we never culture a dressing right a dressing is used to protect a wound and protect uh, and prevent infection uh, but also to allow healing to occur right a dressing should be lar large enough to totally cover the wound with a safety margin of about two to three centimeters on all sides um, beyond the wound. Airing out most wounds isn't beneficial because wounds need moisture to heal. Leaving a wound uncovered may dry out new cells that are produced on the surface, which can then increase pain and slow down the healing process, right? 
Most wound treatments or, or coverings promote keeping the wound bed moist, right? Um, and that's why they heal better. We use dressings to absorb drainage as well. Um, we off, obviously we use them to prevent contamination, prevent mechanical injury, um, to help maintain pressure, to prevent excessive bleeding, to provide and keep a moist wound environment, and to provide comfort for our patients. Bandage rolls provide fast wicking action to absorb exudate. Um, they, they're really great with, with their absorbency, right? So if we have a wound that's draining, we're definitely going to use it. Um, it's an inexpensive way to fill wounds, too, that have deep areas of tissue missing um, due to, uh, you know, the wound itself, right? Again, we're going to pack the wound so they heal from the inside out and thus don't form fistulas or false pathways. Um, they can be these, uh, this material that we pack the wound with can be coated with a needed manic medication if like an antibiotic, um, or it can be used for moisture. We could coat it with sylvadine, which helps also regenerate tissue. But remember, pack lightly and watch the moisture, um, but not overly wet or too dry. Excellent. Okay, uh, contact layer dressing. So we're gonna be looking at uh, zero forms and Adaptex and like they're, they're greasy gauzing, right? Um, so they're, these are non-adherent, uh, they prevent trauma, uh, they permit exudate to pass through the pores of the dressing for absorption by a secondary dressing. Uh, they are really relatively inexpensive. We use these contact layers on superficial wounds with minimal to moderate exudate. And obviously the goal of these is to clean up the wound. Hydrocolloid dressings provide a moist and insulating healing environment which protects uninfected wounds while allowing the body's own enzymes to help heal wounds. These dressings are unique because they don't have to be changed as often as some other dressings and they're able they're, we are able to use them really easy, okay? Um, Hydrocolloid dressings contain a gel forming agent inside a wafer. Um, they have a waterproof backing and they come in a variety of shapes um, and they absorb any type of exudate um, and they maintain moisture on the wound bed. It insulates the wound, therefore it protects it from infection and it's non-permeable, right? That those dressings are. Um, they're made especially for difficult to dress wounds. Um, areas like the elbows or the knees, um, the, we use hydrocolored dressings there all the time. Uh, these dressings are helpful to use on wounds that are uh, clean and uninfected, that are free of dirt or other debris, that are dry or little to no drainage. Uh, because these dressings are flexible and water resistant, they also make an excellent protective layer for recently healed wounds or for partly healed wounds with granulation tissue that needs protection from trauma. Uh, furthermore, a, hydro a hydrocolloid dressing can mold around the wound and provide insulation so that the body doesn't need to use as much energy to heal that wound. Polyure polyurethane foam is a non-adherent foam containing two layers. There is a hydrophilic foam part, uh, which has a really high absorption capacity. Um, and then we have transparent polyurethane film that acts as a bacterial and viral barrier while allowing optimal moisture uh, transmission. And then a polyurethane foam is used um, to manage light to moderate uh, drainage or exudate, uh, partial to full thickness wounds, and that would include wounds like pressure ulcers, venous leg ulcers, arterial leg ulcers, diabetic foot ulcers, first and second degree burns, tracheostomy wounds, surgical wounds. Um, it can be used as an aid to prevent skin breakdown, uh, non-adherent foam. Uh, it's used to absorb exudate, to insulate, um, all kinds of stuff, right? 
So we use it again for superficial weeping wounds or wounds that have large to uh, moderate to large amounts of drainage um, because it acts like a sponge, right, to absorb that, that drainage. And again, for deep wounds, we're going to cover it. Uh, we can leave these polyurethane foams on for three days um, or we change them when half of the um, foam is saturated with drainage. The, su the success of hydrogel dressings is thought to be due to their ability to maintain an optimum wound healing environment, which is warm and moist, rather than drying it out, um, and also keeping, uh, you know, it covers up the wound, so it keeps out infective agents like bacteria and funguses and viruses and parasites, etc. right? Hydrogel dressings are composed of about 90% water suspended in a gel made up of an insoluble polymer, which swells up uh, with when it, it comes into contact with water. So the hydrogel provides moisture, which enables painless uh, debridement of a necrotic or infected wound, right? The tissue. It helps promote granulation tissue and it allows for vis visualization of the wound itself, right? Um, it, it, this dressing is non-absorbent and it does encourage complete healing of the wound. Um, since they have a high water content, they are not completely absorbed. Uh, which makes them appropriate for wounds that have light to moderate exudate. In other situations, the accumulation of water can result in skin maceration and also multiplication of microbes, uh, leading to a big infection and then a foul-smelling wound, all of those things, right? So if there's more than moderate exudate, you don't want to use these, but light to moderate, it's totally fine and helpful. So when we use these dressings on superficial wounds with minimal drainage or moderate drainage, they're good to go. And they're also really good for arterial ulcers. Okay, what is an alginate dressing? Biodegradable alginate dressings are made from seaweed and they date back to 50 years ago, right? Um, back in 1983 though, we came up with the commercial kind that we use in medicine. Um, these are often used on wounds with heavy exudate. The alginates used to produce these dressings are made from, again, a variety of seaweeds that are harvested around the world. When used to dress a wound, um, which is exudating heavily, right, so we have a lot of drainage, the calcium ions in the dressing itself interact with the sodium ions in the fluid from the wound. This reaction makes the fiber in the dressing swell and partially dissolve into a gel. How much the alginate dressing swells depends on the chemical composition of the product and the biological source of the material itself, right? So when do we use alginate dressings? Alginates can be used in a variety of situations. Um, it can be used with sloughing wounds uh, that also produce exudate. Um, the alginate dressing provides a moist cover to prevent the wound from drying out and allows the wound to heal more quickly. Um, pressure ulcers, we use alginate dressings on pressure ulcers, on diabetic foot ulcers, on cavity wounds, on venous leg ulcers, post-operative wounds, uh, trauma wounds, partial thickness burns. Most of the time, alginate dressings can be left unchanged for five to seven days unless the exudate capacity is reached, right? Then we want to switch it out. With infected wounds, though, the bed should be inspected daily. So we do have to change those out. Moisture barriers are creams, gels, ointments, or paste preparations formulated to protect the skin from excessive moisture due to incontinence, perspiration, or wound drainage. They help wick away moisture from the skin. Indicated for use on stage one pressure injuries, on peri wound skin to prevent maceration, and on pressure points and bony prominences for the prevention of skin breakdown. Ingredients vary based on the manufacturer's formulation, but most common skin protectants are made from dimethicone, petroleum, and zinc oxide. Moisture barriers can be the final step in the process of cleansing, moisturizing, and protecting the genital and rectal areas for prevention of skin breakdown. 
Skin care moisture barriers are creams, gels, ointments, or paste formulated to protect the skin, again, from excessive moisture due to incontinence, perspiration, wound drainage, to prevent moisture-associated skin damage. Um, let me see. What else do I want to say? I think that's it on this. Compression therapy helps increase blood circulation in the lower legs, ankles, and feet, and it's used with chronic venous insufficiency, varicose veins, deep vein thrombosis, swelling or edema of the feet, ankles, or legs, leg ulcers, wounds, and orthostatic hypotension. It is also an effective treatment for pain and swelling caused by any condition associated with poor circulation and can be left on for up to one week. There are many types of compression therapy devices available over the counter or with a prescription. Compression therapy is a common treatment to help improve blood flow in your legs. It usually involves the use of elastic stockings or wraps, and the elastic provides compression on your legs, ankles, and feet. This helps prevent blood from pooling and fluid from building up in those areas. Um, we have compression stockings, right? They go up to the knee. Um, these are the most common type, right? We have bandages and wraps, right? Some have Velcro on them. Some of them are just normal bandages that we wrap. We have inflatable devices, right? So they are put on the legs and they are uh, like SCDs, sequential compression devices, right? Um, all right, medical adhesives or tape is used to attach bandages, gauze, and other dressings to the skin around the root, around the wounds. Most adhesive tapes are pressure sensitive tapes. Um, there's no need for heat activation or solvents. Medical adhesive tapes can be made from various materials, uh, but they do provide comfort for the patient, okay? Um, Micropore paper tape are commonly used to um, secure bandages and dressings on the skin without leaving a residue. Um, we have transpo transparent hypoallergenic um, that will stick to the patient without sticking to the surgical gloves, all kinds of, we have zinc oxide tape. We commonly use those to uh, put zinc oxide, a protective uh, solution on the skin itself, on the wounds itself. It accelerates healing, stabilizes injury, and protects um, the skin from soft tissue damage. All right, let's see. Uh, we have cloth tape we talked about, right? So there's different type of tapes. There's even waterproof tape, right? So um, it does have, the waterproof tape has, has a little bit of limitations itself. But remember, when you're pulling off these tapes, you need to be very, very careful and make sure that you don't pull the patient's skin off with the tape, okay? Um, okay, when you're injured, your body needs extra energy and nutrients to meet your body's increased needs and to help heal the wound. This means that nutrition plays a very important role in wound healing. One of the keys to wound healing is collagen, a protein in your body that provides structure and support to your skin, your support to your muscles, your bones, and your connective tissues. Wound healing involves the body replacing the damaged tissue with new tissue, and this process requires an increased intake of calories, protein, and particularly nutrients. Wounds heal faster when we take in an adequate amounts of the right foods. When your, your body is healing, calories provide energy to keep your body functioning. Protein helps build, maintain, and repair body tissues. Vitamins and minerals help to repair and rebuild damaged tissue. Optimal wound healing requires adequate nutrition. Nutritional deficit, deficits impedes the normal process that allows progression through all stages of the wound healing. Malnutrition has also been related to decreased wound tensile strength and increased infection rates. Malnourished patients can develop pressure ulcers, infections, and delayed wound healing that results in chronic non-healing non wounds. Chronic wounds are a significant cause of morbidity and mortality for many patients and therefore constitutes a serious clinical concern. Because most patients with chronic skin ulcers suffer micronutrient status alterations and malnutrition to some degree, current nutritional therapies are aimed at correcting nutritional deficiency, defi deficiencies with these patients, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna do a nutritional eval of our wound 
patients to ensure that they are getting the 100 grams of protein daily that they need to get in order to allow excellent wound healing. And of course, protein comes from beans, poultry, lean cuts of red meat, soy, tofu, eggs, dairy, nuts, what else? Greek yogurt, peanut butter. I mean, I could keep going on, right? It's always good to get a nutritional consult again and to determine any barriers that your patient has to eating sufficient amounts of protein daily. Excessive moisture has multiple causative factors, including continuous contact with feces or urine, right? So when patients sit in their briefs for a while, it will cause skin breakdown really easy. Heavily exudating wounds, wetness around um, due to excessive perspiration, especially in the folds of the skin, right? So moisture associated skin damage is defined as the damage occurring in response to pro prolonged skin exposure to moisture. Once the skin is saturated, it becomes more susceptible to friction and shearing, which in turn allows the normal harmless skin flora to penetrate the barrier, resulting in a secondary infection. The irritation and damage is a result of the disruption of the uh, lipid layer, uh, resulting in dissolving effect of the physical barrier to skin. So it literally takes away our physical barrier of our skin to protect us from foreign invaders like bacteria, right? Additionally, disruption of the skin's protective mechanisms often leads to an excess in skin moisture or dryness, which may result in breakdown of the skin surface. This can be demonstrated in the extremities of the hand and feet after a prolonged soak in the bathtub, where excessive moisture results in the wrinkling of the fingers, toes, or with repeated hand washing, as, as we know as nurses, exposes us to really dry skin. Excessive moisture also increases the risk of friction damage due to skin maceration. So we need to minimize exposure to moisture and or soiling. We need to use briefs and under pads to wick away moisture from the skin. We need to teach our patients and caregivers to cleanse the skin right after the patient soils, right? And we need to use proactively skin barrier creams. Preventing pressure ulcers has been a nursing concern for many years. In fact, Florence Nightingale back in 1859 wrote, if he has a bed sore, it's generally, generally not the fault of the disease, but of the nursing staff. Although the prevention of pressure ulcers is a multidisciplinary responsibility, nurses play a major role. Mortality is also associated with pressure ulcers. Several studies noted mortality rates as high as 60% for older persons with pressure ulcers within one year of a hospital discharge. Most often, pressure ulcers do not cause death. Rather, the pressure ulcer develops after a sequential decline in health status. Pressure ulcers develop when capillaries supplying the skin and subcutaneous tissues are compressed enough to impede perfusion, leading ultimately to tissue necrosis. More than 100 risk factors of pressure ulcers have been identified. Some physiological and non-physiological risk factors that may place adults at a risk for pressure ulcer develop include the following. Diabetes mellitus, peripheral vascular disease, cerebral vascular accidents, sepsis, and hypotension. Additional factors that have been correlated with pressure ulcer development um, are uh, over the age of 70, currently smoking, or you had a history of smoking, dry skin, low body mass index, impaired mobility, altered mentation or mental status, like confusion, right? Um, urinary and fecal incontinence, patients who are malnutrition, patients who are on physical restraints, patients who have malignancies, patients who have a history of pressure ulcers, tons of examples, right? A nurse's role in pressure ulcer prevention is 10 step. Educate the patients and their families about pressure injury prevention, so proper protein nutrition, proper hydration, how to properly move a patient up in bed, changing patients' briefs as soon as they're soiled or wet, um, dealing with patients who have decreased activity, um, 
making sure patients and families know what friction and shear are and how to prevent them, uh, keeping the basically keeping the skin clean and dry and not causing damage to it, right? Um, we need to move our patients frequently, get them, you know, encourage them to get up and move around frequently. Uh, we need to make sure we're pre uh, preventing irritants from being exposed to the skin. Again, keeping the patients clean and dry. Um, and then managing their incontinence. Uh, we need to apply barrier creams prophylactically. We need to keep our patients well hydrated and well nourished. We need to consider collagen for pressure ulcers. Again, check the skin thoroughly on admission. And I mean every crack and crevice of the skin you check on admission and every shift, at least once every shift. Okay? All right, this is the end of this chapter.